agar dilution method of determining antimicrobial MICs has been around for decades. In a diagnostic setting, it's really fallen out of favor because of the availability of commercially prepared media. The principle of this technique is that we incorporate antibiotics into Mueller Hinton agar plates, spot on a defined concentration of bacteria, incubate it overnight, and look for growth. You can see a, a photo of an agar dilution plate that was prepared in my lab with all of the different bacterial colonies growing. In the cartoon along the top, you can see four example plates. Um, this is a dilution series of tetracycline from one, two, four, and eight micrograms per milliliter. Each of these plates has been inoculated with a bacterial isolate and incubated overnight. Following that overnight incubation, you can see that colonies have formed on some plates, but not all of them. And by comparing uh, where we get growth and where growth is inhibited, we can determine an organism's minimum inhibitory concentration. So if we start with our very low concentration of tetracycline, one microgram per milliliter, and focus on this colony here, you can see that we have growth on one, two, and four, but not eight micrograms per milliliter of tetracycline. And so in this case, we would have a minimum inhibitory concentration or MIC of eight micrograms per milliliter. Standardization is really, really important as with any other susceptibility test method. We need to ensure that we have fresh colonies, that we're inoculating our plates with a McFarlane 0.5 density of, of growth, that we incubate our plates with a standard temperature, time and atmosphere, that we're using Mueller Hint and Agar, which is standardized for cation concentration and pH, and of course that we include quality control organisms so that we can uh, assess the performance of our test. So why would we choose to do agar dilution in the context of all of the other susceptibility test methods that we have available to us? Some of the advantages are that there's a low reagent cost per sample, particularly if you're testing a large number of isolates. It's highly customizable because we are preparing this media in-house. You can select exactly the drugs you want to test and the range of concentrations over which you test them. It's technically quite simple to perform, although there are many steps and no specialized equipment is required. Disadvantages of agar dilution is that it, it may not be terribly efficient if small numbers of samples are used. Because we're preparing this media in-house, it can be very laborious and the cost of technical time can be a limiting factor. The first step in preparing media for agar dilution is to weigh out our antimicrobial powders. We do this using an analytical balance, which is a precision instrument that allows us to mass out powders in milligram quantities. So before we measure out our antibiotic powders, we first have to calculate exactly how much we need. And this is based on really two main factors. How many isolates will be tested and what concentrations of each antibiotic will be used, particularly the highest concentration. When considering how many isolates will be tested, it's very important to remember that this media needs to be used fresh. So you only want to make as many plates as you can reasonably use in 48 to 72 hours. This is the equation that I use to calculate the mass of powder that's required. First, we consider the number of samples that we're testing. Divide that by the number of samples which can be tested on each plate. This will give us essentially the number of batches of plates we need in order to test all of the samples in our isolate collection. When preparing our media, we always add in a margin of error. It's important to account for technical issues that can arise. Our highest concentration tested in micrograms per milliliter, 20 milliliters per plate. This is our final plate volume. And then finally, we need to make twice the amount required. And the reason for that will become obvious when I explain how we do our dilution series. Once we have our powder, we first need to solubilize it and then dilute it into an appropriate volume of liquid. Not all drugs are soluble in water, and so I would encourage you to consult the CLSI guidelines for a list of appropriate solvents and diluents for each compound. The volume of drug solution that we need can be calculated using a similar equation. So the number of samples divided by 30 uh, plus two, our, our margin of error, multiplied by two milliliters. 
If we consider an example situation to apply this equation, um, we can consider 100 isolates to test and the highest concentration of drug X that we're going to be testing of 128 micrograms per milliliter. So when we plug this information into the equation, you can see here we have 100 samples, we can test 30 per plate, here's our maximum concentration, 20 mil volume of the plate, and then we need to make twice as much. Um, that gives us 3.33 sets of plates, which of course we have to round up to four. A final mass of 2,560 micrograms of drug per plate, concentration times volume gives us mass. So we need six sets of plates and a total of 30,720 micrograms or 30.72 milligrams. Next, we need to calculate the volume of drug solution that's required. So taking this similar equation, we can see that we have six sets of samples times two milliliters per sample, and then we double the volume. So it's a total of 24 milliliters that we need to dissolve this uh, antimicrobial powder in. And when we do that, you can see that we get a final concentration of 1,280 micrograms per milliliter. This is 10 times higher than our desired concentration in the dilution series of 128 micrograms per mil. I'll explain exactly why this is in our next slide. So here we have our suspension of our drug, and what we need to do is make one in two dilutions of this to give us our dilution series of antibiotics that we're ultimately going to have in plates. So we're going to take 12 mils, combine that with 12 mils of sterile water uh, for a final concentration of 640 micrograms per milliliter, and then repeat this as many times as necessary to give us the concentration range we want in our experiment. The next step is to incorporate these antimicrobial suspensions into agar to give us our final media that we'll use in our susceptibility test. We take two milliliters of each suspension and combine that with 18 milliliters of molten Mueller Hinton agar. So we have a final volume of 20 milliliters, which gives us another one in 10 dilution. Let's see how all of these steps look in the real world. Once we have our antibiotic powder weighed out, the next step is to label tubes to make our drug dilutions. Now we're ready to move to the biosafety cabinet to pour our plates. The first step whenever preparing agar is to label your plates, and I recommend doing this on the bottom agar side. That way if the lids get lost, you'll always know what drug and what concentration of that drug is present in each. We prepare 18 milliliter Mueller Hinton tubes in advance, and at this stage, we melt them in a boiling water bath between 95 and 100 degrees Celsius. Once these tubes have melted, we transfer them into a 50 degree water bath so that they can cool to the point where we're able to work with them. We now add two milliliters of antibiotic suspension into each 50 degree molten agar tube. We need to do this quickly enough to ensure that our agar doesn't re-solidify, but slowly and carefully enough that we don't get bubbles forming in the plate. Once the antibiotic has been added, we carefully invert the tube several times to mix the contents thoroughly, and then pour out the agar into a pre-labeled petri dish. Our plates are then left to solidify with the lids ajar. We do this in the biosafety cabinet to minimize the possibility of contamination. Now that we have our media, we're ready to test our isolates. As with all susceptibility testing, we start by making a McFarlane 0.5 suspension of our organisms. As an additional quality control step, I make up this suspension using isolated colonies from the fourth streak on our plates. That helps me to be confident that I'm working with a pure culture. To perform the test, we spot a particular volume of our McFarlane 0.5 suspension onto the agar plates. In our lab, we do this using a replicator plate system. And the first step of this process is to uh, dispense our bacterial suspensions into each of the wells of this well plate. We transfer our well plate to the replicator device, and we're now ready for our autoclaved stainless steel pin plate. These stainless steel pins are calibrated such that they deliver exactly 0.1 microliters of our McFarlane 0.5 suspension, giving us uh, a final inoculum of 5 times 10 to the 4 colony forming units per spot, which is in accordance with the CLSI guidelines. 
Using the arm of the replicator, we then dip our pins into the well plate before placing a Petri dish on the other side. We then move our pin plate over to the agar dish, spotting our inoculum onto the Mueller Hinton surface. These plates are then allowed to sit uh, right side up for 10 to 15 minutes so that any liquid can absorb. We then turn them upside down and incubate them overnight at 35 degrees Celsius. We then inspect our plates for growth. What we're looking for is the presence or absence of a colony on each plate at each pin location. Remember, each one of these colonies represents a unique bacterial isolate, and by looking at which concentrations they grow at, we can determine the organism's MIC. Here you can see a plate map where each spot is numbered, and below that a key where we've described which of our isolates is found in each spot. We then inspect the plates and record presence or absence of growth at each drug concentration. Finally, using this data, we determine each organism's MIC. We can then categorically describe an isolate as susceptible or resistant by comparing our results with the CLSI or UCAST resistance breakpoints. I hope this helped you to better understand the agar dilution method. I'll put links to some key references in the description of the video, and if you do have any questions, put them in the comment section below.